This is Transparency, a podcast by Gender Dysphoria Alliance, hosted by Aaron Kimberly and Aaron Terrell. Each week we'll be joined by people who have personal or professional experience with gender dysphoria and physical transition. We'll also discuss how our trans experiences relate to the concept of gender identity. Join us for a compassionate yet heterodox approach to the question of trans. All right, welcome back to Transparency, everybody. We are joined today uh, with uh, Luke. Uh, he's a member of Gender Dysphoria Alliance as well. Uh, he's coming to us today from Ireland. Uh, so thanks very much for being uh, with us, Luke. Feel free to introduce yourself however you'd like. Uh, yeah, I'm. my name's Luke. I transitioned uh, female to male. Uh, I'm Irish. I grew up all over the world, really, in a very liberal household um but yeah well I suppose we'll get into that so yeah we'd we'd love to just get to know you a little bit Luke you've been a member of the gender dysphoria alliance for a while now um and we've we have talked to you before but I would love to just get to know you a little better and hear more of of your story so can you maybe maybe that would be a good place to start if you could just talk a little bit about some of your earlier member memories of what gender dysphoria was like for you um yeah well I, I didn't come across the term gender dysphoria for quite a lot, many years um in the future but I just gravitated towards um I suppose mas- masculine toys typically masculine toys um I, I really liked uh or unisex toys as well um I really liked uh I was a huge animal lover um I love the, uh, I don't know if you guys know about the Schleck animal uh, toys. They're like hard animals that you can get building supplies for them and all that kind of stuff. Um, but, I don't think uh, I'm familiar with those. Huh? I don't think I'm familiar with those. Me either. Really? Oh my gosh. They're great. You can get like dinosaur ones and ice age ones and they're, they're, I, I think they're great. Um I love them anyway, uh, and most of my my friends growing up were tomboys. We're all girls who loved uh, art and who loved uh, playing outside and just doing regular activities. I guess we weren't very. Um, I wouldn't say we're very gr- girlish, but I, I don't really look it. Um, I don't view uh, any of that as anything really to do with gender as we see it now um i my 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 parents kind of traveled everywhere and uh i grew up a bit all over the place but um most of my my primary school was was in bahrain and um, and that was a lot of multicultural um people were there there was it was a prob- predominantly a Muslim country, but I mean, there, there was only about three Muslims in my class. Um, there was a few, there was two Irish girls. Um, there was an Irish boy. There's people from Australia, America, Sweden, uh, Germany, France, Spain, like everywhere, England. So, um, a cosmopolitan upbringing. Yeah. Yeah, like just you know people just had different households and did live different ways but she just had the same kind of you know um we got on with each other and i don't know you said a, a lot of your friends growing up were also were, were tomboys did did you do you think that you how do i want to articulate this like do you do you feel like you were different from the girls that were tomboys do you, like, do you feel like your gender dysphoria at that time, even though you didn't have that word for it, did you track that you were different from them in some way or, or that you felt like you really were a boy in ways that they maybe didn't? Not really. Um, I mean, I looked at guys and I said, oh, I want short hair. And I remember seeing uh, walking down um, or in uh in uh in the city one time and i was r- walking out of a a mall um 
and there was I think she was an Indian lady w- walking down and she had a little girl in the in the pram and she had short hair so I, I was like oh well um and I, I like girls and women around me had short hair um but uh, I didn't think that was because of the co- my you know that's the Indian culture or whatever and I said, well, I'm Irish, so probably I'll do that when I'm older. Um, because I only really saw la- ladies and women with short hair. Um, and uh, you know, the if I was at the beach or something, we, you know, I want the the top off. But um, I mean, I was always very stubborn from the moment I could dress myself. You know, my mom had me and um. In uh, they were girls shorts, but they were you know the swimming shorts, the uh, the the, sa- the sailors or the um what you call the dash sport um the surfers use the surfing t-shirts. So I just wore those swimming, um and you know they were black or something or uh you know so th- there was no uh, I I I wore I wore girls stuff from the girls departments but they, they they were very masculine you know they, they weren't uh they weren't they, i was never pushed into a box but you kind of it sounds like you kind of identified yourself as a girl and that, that you were kind of like looking to other girls and uh or women and, and kind of um uh mirror like kind of you 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 associated yourself as one of them right like so you were you were thinking as far as like okay i gotta have a short i can have a short haircut if um you know if I see girls having short haircuts. Would you say that's correct, or I would phrase it a bit differently? I knew I was a girl, but I, uh, like, I wanted to be a boy, and I, I looked at my dad and I opposed to my mom, and I said, "Oh, I want to have, you know, stubble or something, or you know, I want to be like that one, look like a man when I'm older." Um, but there was no, there was never any. You know, there was nothing that I couldn't do that that men like men can do that I couldn't because I'm a girl. You know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. not until puberty, anyway. You know, uh, you start developing and you can't take the t-shirt off anymore. And um, I suppose there's there's more girls and boys will will start separating more, and uh, there you know there's there's a, more of an obvious statement between the two sexes um so yeah i I grew to yeah i grew to i grew to despise men i i i have a i still think i do have a bit of a hatred towards men i have a problem with men um but uh, and i definitely had a jealousy as as a teenager um but uh, I think that was to do with with hearing the feminist movement of, you know, ma- male privilege and the the fact that uh, men don't have to get pregnant and men have it easy in life and men make more more money than women and um, all that that stereotypical stuff that I now being on the other side of the spectrum as looking and, and sounding and walking through life as a man, I, I see there's a lot of privileges of being a woman and no one ever talks about that. And um, there's definitely a, a problem with that, with, I think with showing women that, that uh, yeah, show, showing women that, there's, there's advantages of being a man and there's adv- advantages of being a woman and they the vice versa for each one and I think it's it's harming men as well um, I've talked a lot to men who who are implicated with this and um, the boy crisis is a great book um, that explains all that how old were you when when you first started to think of um of transitioning and and medicalizing your gender dysphoria? Uh, I didn't know about trans or anything um, until I was about, I think it was 15 or 16. I can't remember exactly. 
um, when I found out what transgender was. But when I was 13, I found out that uh, the the double double mastectomy was a thing. Uh, unfortunately, uh, my mom's friend had breast cancer and that was when I found out you could remove that part of your body. And I, of course, this was 13 year old me having this plan of, I can put in, just write up my own note, my doctor, and I can get the surgery and it, that, that would be it. And I can just cut my hair short and dress as a man. Um, and I knew legally changing your name was a thing. So, um, I don't know how I how I knew that, but um, I, that was just my plan. And then uh, from a really young, early age, uh, I I knew being gay was a thing as well. Um, my mom always said she always she always knew something was up. She didn't know about she didn't know about being trans either. Uh, but she knew about people being gay and she said look uh, if if you end up with a man or a woman or whoever um, she always said that to me talking about puberty or anything like that um, and so that's how I, I I think I saw the that that was the more masculine thing to do was be with a woman so um, I, I assumed I was gay and I came out as gay first and that was like whatever um and i did i didn't start medically transitioning uh i was 19 when when i started medically medically transitioning i did go to a doctor when i was 16 um that was i think that was 20 2015 2014 25 no it wouldn't have been jesus it was tw- jesus it was 2014. God, time goes fly, <laughs> fly, fly, doesn't it? Um, 2014, I went to a GP, my GP, and uh, asking for a referral to the gender clinic in Dublin. And then they came back to me and said I was too young, so I had to wait till I was 18, and I'm glad that happened. Um, but uh, So I went when I was 18, and... Uh, I went for, I only had, I had three sessions and uh, I had top surgery and then I went on testosterone uh, 10 days after having top surgery. Um, so you first went in when you were 16 and did you like carry on having, having therapy or anything like that? Or did they basically just say, come back in two years and we'll treat you? Uh, I was in therapy uh, for I was in therapy for most of my life for other issues. Um, I had a really uh, extreme, uh, I had a really extreme um, brain injury when I was when I was born, and so I was in uh, I was in counselling. I was in uh, speech therapy, speech and language therapy. I was in um, I don't know what you call it, but like. Uh, I had issues with, you know, being able to hold things and pick things up and my communication as well, uh, intellectual disabilities, I guess. Uh, I don't know what you'd call that from a therapeutic point of view, but anyway, I was in that. Um, here in Ireland, there's this thing called the Lucina Clinic, and the Lucina Clinic is uh, where I was, and it's like... Uh, it's like a day center the well well it's not like you go in for like an hour or two it's not you're not you're not like in it for the whole day but um they have like multiple different types of doctors probably other sorts of therapy therapists in there as well um and they are um i don't think they had any idea really about the gender stuff um but i i want once once I was seeing someone, you know, and I had a lot going on. Um, my parents were were divorced, and uh, when I was in secondary school, they divorced, and that was a huge thing for me. So uh, I struggled with that a lot when I was a teenager. But 
yeah so i was in therapy but it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't really still with gender stuff you know did gender ever come up in the therapy sessions oh yeah i did when i when i came out i i made sure everyone you know um everyone knew and um uh with the name change or whatever and uh I legally changed all my documents. That was the first thing I did when I was 18. Um, and I was 19 when I, when I had medical intervention. So here in Ireland, you don't need to, uh, I think it's about 60, 60 to 80 euro to change all your documents um, legally. And you don't, you don't need to be seeing a gender clinic or anything like that. So it's not restrictive really at all. Okay. The gender recognition came in, um, in, I think it was 2015. So I did it. I think it was 2016 when I, yeah, 2016. Now when you're over, over 18, you can, you can, you can just go in and do it uh, and you have to have a witness. Um, but when you're over, I think it's changed now. I'm not too sure what the deal is now, but, uh, when you're, under under 18 you, you do need to go through you did at that stage you needed to go through a court case and all this kind of stuff and um, i remember one person going through it and it, it was it was chaotic so so you don't need any kind of diagnosis or like a letter from a doctor or anything like no, that you can you can just unless go in you're and... under unless you're under 18 kind of a kind of an alarming thought to me anyway that any adult for any reason can just walk in and, and legally change their gender and all their documents yeah i mean i don't know i haven't looked into it i don't know if like obviously if you've I, caused any criminal stuff a criminal record know. or something you might might interfere with that process yeah, yeah. i don't so <laughs> I, I i didn't have to deal with that so i have no clue but and I've, I did it with a, I was a lot of people's witnesses. So I've, I've done it about five times at this stage. Um, and uh, so I do know the process for over 18s, unless it's changed. But Is that what they call the GRC? The gender recognition certificate? Is that, the, is that a different yes. thing? It is? Okay. No, that's right. Okay. So you just go in and say, you know, hey, you know, I'm I'm a female who identifies as male. I want to change my my gender marker to M and I want to change my name to this. And they're just like, Yes, sir, here you go. No, you, you need to you you need to have your witness. You you go you fill out print out all the all the forms, you bring your witness, uh, you have to get it signed, the papers must be signed. Uh from from for a, uh, by a solicitor uh, okay. with your witness uh, and then you bring it to the courts okay and you need <laughs> to have uh, you need to have your PPSN you need uh, you need to have um, proof of address you need to have your birth certificate and you need to have your passport or some kind of photo ID right and date but like to to legally verify who you are an irish citizen (laughs) yeah yeah but you don't so the bed a a doctor or a therapist doesn't weigh in on the situation it's all just a legal procedure right if you're over 18 yes yeah okay yes it's 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 fascinating how different it is from place to place right And, and i mean for someone that has gender dysphoria and they've transitioned i mean it's it's great that they're not making it difficult to change all of that but yeah it's it's surprising that because i think in here there's it's still the requirement that a doctor signs off you know that yes you have gender dysphoria and and they um they're advocating on your behalf to to change your markers accordingly as far as i know that's still the process here yeah it's interesting in ireland because it kind of just i didn't even know about it to be honest um it, it unless you're working in the gender area or you're transitioning or you know someone uh i didn't even know the gender identity thing or gender recognition came in only last year when 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 i was doing it um so there was no debate about it or anything it just like 
no one it wasn't on the I don't it might it might have been on the news but I mean my mom didn't know anything about it or you know so it just kind of it seemed to just slip in there um but it's it's causing um problems I'm debating now really if if uh if changing your your gender identity legally is is an okay thing to do because I, d- I don't know if you guys know this but the, in the last three to five years we've 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 discovered in ireland something very very unfortunate as has ha- happened in the past with the um uh you know if, if, a, if a woman wasn't married and she had a child out of wedlock they were the child was taken away from her, the baby, and given either to another family home, uh, or um, or or uh, went into a, a home, essentially, um, like a fo- a foster unit or something, and they were they were completely und- undocumented. The babies were found in um, like slums and things just a few years ago. And they, there's people now. There's people in, in, the, who had like survivors who had, um, who, like survivors that are in their in their thirties, forties, fifties now that are are finding their their biological parents. And uh, there was other issues where like one lady was on um, the Late Late Show, and which is a a very famous uh, show in in Ireland, in the Republic of Ireland, um, and she had medical issues, and of course she was put into a home, and the because it, they didn't have any anything on the biological mother or the biological parents at all, she couldn't backtrack that this medical condition could be a thing that's that's lead that's connected with with the parents um so i i've come to the conclusion now if i want to have biological kids you know i know i look like a man and everything but you know i i i wonder okay if i if i try if i change my gender marker back uh, and then can i change it back again to male or something after I've had the child, uh, but how is that going to affect um, you know my work? Like I work with with kids, and um, I don't know. You guys probably have something similar. It's called Garda vetting here. Uh, Garda is I is the Irish word for police, and Garda vetting is is a is a report legal p- report that's done for anyone working with children or adolescents uh, it just goes back to make sure like you're not uh, a criminal or you're not it's 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 a legal document protecting the children basically mm-hmm. um so essentially like i get this for it now as well with filling out legal forms and documents and census forms and like how like how am i going to navigate that you know um and i i don't i don't I don't think that I know you could argue that it's it's you could argue argue against me very easily saying well because of the equality act uh, it shouldn't make a difference but um you know if if a school or if I was working in a Montessori or something was looking and seeing right this person's you know female or male and then female and then male again. Like, what's up with that? You know, like, it's just it's just really complicated. And I'm just, so yeah. I, I don't know what to think about it anymore. So are you saying that if you had biological children, you'd want to be recorded as, as mother? Is, is that why you're oh, thinking? Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I, I disagree that if anyone does, I do disagree with that because it, it it's, it, it that that document is not for you that's for your child are you seeing any any other problems with you know just any other problems like that with with how the whole 
um, legal aspect of transition is is handled in Ireland. Are you seeing any any other issues since that became law? The adoption thing one is is one that I hadn't really thought of before, but well, I mean, it's it's not just Ireland; it's everywhere. Like you know how we don't. I was just talking. My friend that I was hanging out with today is 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 a therapist, and we were having this. He's uh, works with trans people as well, and like neither of us, like both both of us were asking each other, like, well, what is a man, or what do you mean by I I feel like a man? What does that mean? Like, I I couldn't tell you. Like, I don't know what that means. Like, we have no definitions for this anymore so how the hell are you are you meant to fill out forms how the hell are you meant to look at statistics like what are you talking about when you do a study on like i don't know women in sports or trans people in sports like what is what does that mean like what are you studying what exactly are you studying well depends on the person who you ask well Mm -hmm. it's kind of this kind of a uh, civilization-wide existential crisis we found ourselves in. Yeah, there, I yeah, mean, there's like, a number I, of... I, I generally don't know. Yeah, like, it's, what it's exactly? a tough one, isn't it? Like, Because there's a number of, of different sort of um, really hot talk, talking points. You know, so one of them being... Um, one of them being crimes and how those are being recorded, you know, because statistically um, certain crimes tend to be it more males that commit them, you know, like, like sexual assault, for example, tends to be more males that commit sexual ass- violent sexual assaults than, than females. So how are these crimes now being recorded? Because are we suddenly seeing a spike in, in female, you know, sexual assaults because we're recording trans women with the female statistics. And, and so what does that mean in terms of, um, you know, I mean, how are those statistics used and, and where might that skew data analysis or uh, like, it's hard to know where that, where that leads, right? When those statistics are now kind of being confused and, and muddied by recording, um, you know, biologically male crimes under female category or um, trans women in, in women's prisons, for example, is, is that hit um, Ireland at all? Are you aware of any cases of trans women being transferred to female prisons? Is, is that been sort of a political topic in Ireland? Not discussed, but there is, though, I think I heard that there was one case. Um, but other than that, I, I, I haven't really. Um, I, I haven't, to be honest. Um, but I, I do, I do. Like I even just, I'm only really asking this in, in the sense of myself even, you know, like like I, I'm, I'm studying outdoor sports and uh, like I'm training to be a rock climbing instructor and I, I'm in, I'm doing hill walking, I'm doing kayaking, all that kind of stuff. Um, and they're all there's a lot of a lot of my teachers are saying well you know we're trying to get more women involved and we're talking trying to you know get trans people involved and all this kind of stuff and one you know it's not just that like i i assume that they disagree with me on this but i assume it's biological like i would not be advocating for you know, people wearing binders or anything like that to be doing any of these sports. Um, but I, I do recommend if, if you're interested in any of these sports that they're, you know, they're individual based and they're like sailing, for instance, all the competitions, if you want to look all over the world, uh, they're all unisex, like, you know, they're not gendered sports really. Um, but like there was a study recently done, I think it was in the UK, don't quote me on that, but there was a study done on rock climbers and women, a study found that women uh, had a increase in, in 
self-esteem with rock, with regards to rock climbing and uh, a lot of women find that really empowering um, but it's when studies I hear studies like that and I'm kind of like well am I categorized in that or would, would I not be categorized because I look like a man because if I like what exactly determines like what what study or what statistics do what should I go in? Like if I become pregnant, mm-hmm. am I still in that category of male? Or if I could, if if my body is if I look like I do as a man and I um my body is naturally producing estrogen and I'm not taking testosterone, does that make any difference? Even though you could you know, you could argue that I'm kind of in the middle because hormones give and they don't take. So from testosterone, you know, my shoulders are broader than most women. I could have a bit more muscle mass. I don't really know. Uh, but how, like, my body, if my body's naturally producing estrogen, like of any other woman or any other female, whatever word you want to put on it like where like i'm kind of rambling but like where you know you know what i mean like what 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 categorize like, this is why we need like uh, state like statements of what things mean yeah you're 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 thinking of this more in a in a like an um uh philosophical categorization uh kind of question were you like is this like something that you started to um kind of unpack and dig into recently or were you were you thinking about things like this when you went into transition or were you just thinking i'm i'm going to transition and just be a man that's it or you know were you kind of struggling with the categorization and the and the technical definition of you know men and women prior i wasn't thinking about it this deep but um i got into the like i suppose you call it now the left wing radical trans groups um but I, I wouldn't i don't particularly like that label but anyway um but there was always you know i, I did see a distinction between me and i did say well you know sex is different than gender and that's i'm still biologically female and all this kind of stuff and i that was really the first time and i think Aaron, you said this as well, um, that you found that, you know, there was things that you just didn't say uh, growing up. And, you know, but but that was the first time ever that I entered a space that, you know, asking questions or making statements or raising conversations, you know, you just, there was a sense in the room, you just don't do that. Um, in my life, you know, everything was up for debate, you know, or a- anything was up for questioning. You know, if I saw a, a man growing up, when I was growing up, if I saw a man walking down the road uh, with dress differently or something, uh, I could always ask, you know, like, oh, where, where's he from? Why, does he, why is he wearing that? He look, looks like he's wearing a dress or something like that. Um, and my parents would just say he's from a different religion, he's a different culture. I'm not really sure, but I can find out. Uh, and they'd Google it and they'd tell me. But this was like the first time where, like, no, you, you, you don't talk about this. And that kind of bothered me. Mm-hmm. And it's more so. than just hypotheticals. I mean, it- some of us toy with these ideas as as hypotheticals, maybe. But I, I mean, I think what I appreciate what, uh, about what you're saying is is you're aware that we're we're kind of disrupting, um, we're kind of disrupting natural laws in a way, like you know, because biology is is real, and there are biologically based traits. And it sounds like you're not necessarily that you have all the answers, but it sounds like you're at least open to looking at some of those problems that that are created by 
us legally changing sex. And it sounds like you're, you're, you acknowledge that bio, your biology is real. And it sounds like you're open to conversations about, well, how do we do this then? Like in terms of the, the legalities and ethics of this, how do we do this, right? That's fair and, and reasonable for everybody. Um, and that's, I think, the problem that I have with a lot, some of the more, you know, radical trans activists is they don't even want to acknowledge that. They don't even want to look at that as like, no, I am a male and, and too bad about what the implications are, right? So they're wanting to actually change our entire society's definition of what male and female is, rather than acknowledging, well, there's, there are implications and, and potential problems if, if we don't handle this, you know, in, in legal ways carefully. I think that's my read on, on what you're saying is that you're, you're willing to think about it and willing to have conversations about how to, how to do this. Yeah. But you know, I'm sure you guys remember as well, like when you, when you were super dysphoric and you, you, you were in that space and that tunnel vision and, you know, it, yep. mm -hmm. it's, it's very, very difficult. Like just anyone saying that you're, your, your biological sex or contradicting you or you know it was it's very challenging to put yourself in in the, that shoe those those shoes in that position at that time so you know you, I, I do feel for and I understand because I was exactly in the, that situation um but it's you know I I feel transitioning would fix all my problems when really it's it fixed a lot of it, but like I'm still, I'm dysphoric now about things that I, I'm not, I wasn't dysphoric about back then. And, um, there's, the, I'm dealing with things now that like no, no one has the bloody answers to. Um, so it, it's definitely affected my dating life as well. So, you know, there's, there's all sides of this and, as much as you, you you don't want to listen to someone or you, you don't you think someone's wrong or they don't know anything about this and look maybe they don't but i mean th they may say something that you haven't th thought about before or you're you're not aware of and look you could turn around and say well look i think you're wrong because of blah 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 but you know and they, ho hopefully them open-minded enough to be like, oh, okay, well, yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. You know, so. I, I agree. To... Yeah, I agree that when we're early in transition, it, I don't know if there's any way around that tunnel vision as, as you describe it, right? It, it, it's, um, I haven't met anybody that, that didn't experience something like that through the transition process. And I think some people kind of get stay there they kind of get stuck in that tunnel vision and and others others are able to to work their way out of that at some point not that not that all the ethical dilemmas are gone but but that tunnel vision for some of us does does resolve but i i i thinking back to my state of mind back when i was in that tunnel vision that was definitely not a time in my life where anyone should have listened to me regarding policy or, or <laughs> law right because we're just not in the mental state to think rationally right about these things and um and and unfortunately but unfortunately some of the activists who are still in that frame of mind it's not that i don't understand it and i don't empathize with it but they should not be speaking for all of us and be speaking into how law should be written when they're when they're still really stuck in that way of thinking no but the, i agree with you they shouldn't be talking for the whole trans community um however again meeting people and trying to look at the lens that they're looking through because that's the only way you're going to ever you know work with someone to understand them and maybe change their mind is like you know like uh iron there was, was was in a in a mindset growing up where you know it was just uh correct me if i'm wrong aaron but it was i think it was a catholic view or, or it was some kind of religious view that looked that evangelical that, christian yeah so you know it's the christian view I can't say that word, but whatever a Christian view of, of uh, you know, like this is, this is just the way life is. This is what the Bible says, and that's that's that. And you turn to some that's 
you know, that's great. That's fine. You turn to the radical trans or radical left or whatever, and that's this is all their rules. Cool, great. You go to someone who's Jewish, someone who's atheist, someone who's really, really, really based in science. You know, so who 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 are you to say that they are wrong? Or you you could be wrong, or the Christians could be right over there. You know, like no no one really knows. Like the only way that we know is is if if we're 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 working with with how do I say this? We're in most societies today. We're a democratic society, so we vote and we. The, it doesn't matter if if look if majority of people want this and you this crowd over here don't want that. Too bad. Most people said yes to it. That's what we're going to do, right? Because we want to live in a sim a good. Well, not I wouldn't use that word good, but civilized society as much as we can. But, but who that civilized society could be completely wrong. Of you know, if you want to look at it from the afterlife perspective, and we're all looking down, and you could turn around and be like, "Oh, Jesus Christ, we're completely wrong." You know, like. So un unless you're in every single person's shoes and you've lived every aspect of every cultural, religious doctrine or suppressive life, um, which no one ever has, like no one's completely right or wrong. So the, be the best way is to understand and like as much as you don't want to do it, you know, with myself, for example, picking up the Bible and actually sitting down and reading it, you know, figuring out what the hell these people are on about. And hell, you may you may turn around like, okay, they're kind of right. I mean, I, I would argue the Bible is very, very right so psychologically. Um, I don't know about factually, but psychologically it is. Um, but look, that's, that's, so you need, I'm just kind of getting to like, you know, you need to, on be a, you need to you need to make a step that you may not want to take um to get where people are coming from and pe people aren't open minded minded enough they think they're open minded but uh, in my experience most people aren't open minded the debate's becoming more less and less open minded as we go it seems like it seems like the, you know these different camps um there's a lot of polarization, a lot of kind of mud flinging in, in all directions. These camps aren't really listening to one another, right? These camps, you know, firmly believe that that they have their their own um, sort of private and and entirely correct take on reality, and just want to push that on others, right? Rather than than listening to other points of view and and realizing, well, maybe there is some truth to what the other camp is saying. And, and we're seeing that, like even the things with, let's say, let's, I mean, yes, let's use the one hot topic of, of the women's prisons debate. I mean, that's one that gets people fired up on both sides pretty fast. Um, but it's not at a point of hypotheticals anymore. I mean, one of our local prisons, um, women were protesting because there was um, a trans woman, and I don't even know how long that person identified as, tra as, as trans, but had done a a very violent sexual crime against a female child to the extent that that, that child needed major um, reconstructive surgery after the sexual assault. And that person self ID'd as, as female and is being transferred um, into a female prison. So it, it's not even hypotheticals. I mean, I think women were thinking about this in early days and, and thinking in terms of hypotheticals. So what about this and what about this? But now we're at a point where these things are actually happening and, and, and put, and putting women in, in in danger in that case. So we need to be able to have a, just a conversation. But some people aren't able to have that conversation, right? If they, if they're kind of stuck in that tunnel vision of no, I mean, trans women are women's. Of course, they belong in women's prisons. End of story. No no further debate. So we're not able to to really come up with nuanced 
solutions. I mean, of course, trans women should should be safe and, and respected, but you know, when there's these obviously obviously safety problems, how do we how do we have nuanced conversations when there's co- when there's competing rights? That, that's where it gets really challenging, right? And and people have such strong strong positions, and there isn't a lot of, of nuanced dialogue happening. Because it is like yeah, the um, um, religious. Oh, go on, Luke. No, go on, go on. I was just going to say, going back to what what you were saying with the um, like these com- these uh, conflicting interests, these conflicting perspectives. You know, we can harken back to religion, and it seems like a lot of um, you know the the, the kind of uh, radical trans activism is a new form of religion. But they seem to have had to to actually have the ear of policymakers, and that's that's who you know these the legislatures and policymakers you know across the Western world are listening to this new uh, this new gender religion, and and we're in this this situation now that you know that Aaron you were just describing. Um, uh, so I, anyway, I don't know where I'm where I'm going with that so much as it seems like that's currently where we've landed is, is listening uh, to this, you know, those people that we mentioned with, with the tunnel vision, um, you know, why are we here? How do we get out of it is my question. Yeah, I don't know. I think the only way is to go through it, to be honest, at this point. Um, I think uh, I've said this to a lot of people. Um, I think it, I think we've come from an extremely extreme um, right wing society, and we we're in a really nice place. Not every, I'm not saying everything was perfect, but I think we we're in a great place um, a few years ago for a short time, and I think this is only the beginning of getting into the uh, left wing extreme, the start of the extreme period of history you see it like a pendulum swing essentially yeah and i i I think i think certainly with my transition i had to do extreme things to understand that men aren't aren't terrible creatures but um i think people people only people only realize unfortunately um uh how good things are when they, when they're when they're gone, and mm-hmm. um, I think that's the way society is going to go because I don't I think we're going to push as far as we can to get into a perfect world. And that's where I I I don't want to attach trans identity to a polit- any one political movement. Because politics change, right? The pendulum throughout history, no, the pendulum swings shouldn't. back and forth. And there are times when we're going to be more left leaning. There's times when we're going to be more right leaning. We can all decide for ourselves which party we vote for. But um, if we attach trans identity to, let's say, the left and these and the left wing ideologies, there is going to come mm-hmm. a time where the pendulum is going to swing back again to a more conservative mindset and what will that mean for, for trans people then, right? If, if, we've, if we've conceptualized trans entirely based on these left-wing politics, um, it's gonna come to a natural end at some point. And I think, that's, I think that's where we're at in society, the very beginnings mm-hmm. of that is for the last 20, 30 years or so, we've attached transness to queer theory out of academia in the 90s. And I think we're at a point now where, where we're at a critical moment in history where postmodernism is breaking down and people more and more are recognizing the harms that postmodern does or the, the limits to what postmodernism can do and, and starting to push back on that. But we've created trans identity entirely out of those theories. And so when you start to break down the theory, which of course we're allowed to do, like we're allowed to break down any philosophical theory or political movement, but when people attach have built their entire identity around that, of course, they're going to be psychologically terrified or angry or having extreme reactions to that because you're dismantling their entire concept of self. And I, I really worry about the psychological well-being of our community as we go through that, those growing pains. That's a very good point. And how, how do you think... He- 
Could, do you think you ever get to the to the true self? Because I I, I don't think there is a true self. I think that you know your who you are is going to change over time, and who you were ten years ago is not who you are today, and who you are in ten years time is not going to be who you are. So, um. I don't get this whole real me, true self thing. I think it's, I, I don't, I don't think there is such a thing. I think there's versions of the time of ourselves. Yeah. And, and we're all individuals, but in terms of how we understand gender dysphoria, you know, just con- contrasting it to how we used to understand it. We used to understand this as, as a clinical condition and that you could seek out treatment for that clinical condition. And, and when queer theory became popularized, that that flipped. Where a lot of the the clinicians who were who were treating gender dysphoria from a science based understanding, that completely flipped. Um, starting in the '90s and, and then into the the early 2000s, and continue they're continuing to push that narrative that we understand transness based on queer theory, not based on any clinical formulation. My concern about that is the clinical isn't political, right? So like if you I know there's problems comparing us to any other clinical condition, but let's let's say um, let's say diabetes, just because that's pretty politically neutral. If we all had diabetes, there'd be no expectation that um, that we vote for any particular party or that we follow any particular um, spiritual tradition. We're just individuals, right? And, and of course, as individuals, we're going to change over time. But our condition is rooted in the science, and it's and it's just a condition. And and some people seek treatment for it, and some people don't. Um, I think that's a much more firm foundation that that isn't going to toss us around as politics change. But if we conceptualize gender dysphoria entirely based on a left-wing political movement and and politics swing, I think that's going to create a, a huge identity crisis for people. I don't think I understand where you're coming from, and I do agree with you to some extent. But I don't think you can compare um, those two because they don't have like how would me or us having diabetes um, affect legal aspects of ourselves and society? It wouldn't. Transitioning Mm -hmm. does. Spaces do in society, not even legally. So having diabetes like this, I don't know if there is, well, yeah, actually I do. like ha- having diabetes, having uh, autism, having uh, most medical conditions does not impact legal and societal and social uh, uh, life when transitioning and gender dysphoria does. Um, so I, I don't really, yeah, I suppose that's what I have to say against that. But yeah, you're I right. That there's there's limits to that analogy in terms of how it plays out in, in law and policy. Ab- absolutely. But in terms of concept of self, um, you know, I think when, if we understand this as a, as a clinical condition, I think that that concept, and it needs to be true, right? I'm not saying we should just make up some clinical definition, but it, you know, like if we, I think the more that we understand what gender dysphoria is, I think it, it just grounds our identities in something real and stable, right? That isn't going to be, that isn't going to be tossed around by just different political seasons, um, how are you going to do that though how are you going to do that when when dysphoria is different things different people well yeah i mean i mean is it i mean i think i think the psychologists had it had it mapped out pretty well back in you know the 80s when they were studying at least two types and and i don't know that there's only those two developmental pathways anymore but i think those psychologists are also aware of that 
um, there's still a lot that they don't know. And, and hopefully they, they really start to nail that down for us because it's even hard for us, I think, to have conversations if we're all working with different definitions of what it, it means to be trans. I think that makes it even harder to have conversations about, well, what do we do about this socially and legally? You know, if some people just think we're all perverts, they're going to have a very different opinion about how how do we how do we work this out, you know, legally and, and politically and socially versus if someone thinks of this as as a delusion or like all the all the different things that we've ever heard, right, about what people think dysphoria means. What are the things we've heard? We've heard that, oh, well, you're all just perverts. You're all just delusional. Um, so we need to kind of land on a, on a definition because that 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 then um, suggests a certain a certain direction that it, it, I don't think that society, how, what am I trying to say? I don't think our society would be very accommodating of us in legally and in spaces and stuff if the, if the impression is we're all just perverts, for example, right? Yeah. So, we, so we need to have some kind of common definition of what gender dysphoria is. And, and I agree with you, there's not just one type. And, the, and I think the psychologist would agree with you as well. There's different, different types of gender dysphoria, but we have to have some kind of reality-based definition of what that is in order for us to, to then have a, a larger societal conversation about what does that mean in terms of, of law and policy. Mm. I well, would like, I though, if, if there was some... I know in Ireland uh, that are starting to, and I hope it's... I, ho I hope it's... Uh, it's a more... Um, just not a firm and model, but uh, the gender clinic in Ireland is is developing at the moment, and they've gotten in social workers and therapists and things to attach to it, and um, so they're working on that. So I'm I'm hoping that they're 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 not going just the affirmation. Now that may help some people, um, if they either get a mix of both, or um, you know. That's that's still going to be challenging questions and things like that. Um, people may not like me saying that, but um, I've certainly enjoyed that aspect of therapy. I think it's very beneficial. What aspect of therapy? Um, being challenged, and mm. uh, you know, I find even conversations like this. I haven't ha had it with you guys yet, but um, uh usually when I get on with someone like yourselves or um or any conversation really, you know, you, you find yourself, oh he said or she said something that I, I didn't think about before and I, I don't really know the answer to that and you have to go away and think about it for a few nights and discover that. And that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. A lot, of, a lot of the confusion that happens at a society level of, you know, just different, um, different ideas pulling in, in multiple different directions. I mean, we see that happening in society, but that happens within us too. I mean, that's definitely been my experience that, that it's hard to, to know even internally, where do I land? You know, how do I define what sex and gender are? How do I, where do I like, land on all these different opinions and, and societal questions, right? So those in a way that that is is dysphoria in a sense or an aspect of dysphoria anyway is that is the tension between these different different ideas and and i think maybe some people can um cope with that rather than feeling like they're constantly in that confusion and unrest and and constant questions I, I wonder if that's for some reason why some people have that tunnel vision it's like no I'm just going to land on on this narrative and I'm going to I'm going to hang on to that it, rather than rather than have to tolerate that feeling of uncertainty I think dysphoria is it's being uncomfortable seriously uncomfortable with the situation socially or biologically I would describe it as for you personally was it more social or more was it more about your body at the start it was about my body um then the feminist came in and uh land feminist lands came in i should say um and it got me more 
against men and very anti-men. Um, and I think uh, I think it's transitioning serve as some kind of protection. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very comfortable the way I am, uh, looking like a man or whatever. But but the when I start to get to know people and I develop friendships and things, that's where I'm kind of like, um, you know, I, I feel this urge to come out or with majority of people. Um, because it's, it's, I don't know what it is. I'm trying to figure it out at the moment. I'm hoping um, to figure that out with, I, I, with counseling. I, I have that as well. I feel like um, it's almost like there's a lack, a lack of depth. Okay. Um, you know, if you, if you're starting a friendship or, you know, um, you know, getting more, um, you know, getting, getting a deeper friendship with somebody, um, you know, beyond the, the superficial, it, 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 it seems to become very relevant, um, in, in a lot of ways. Like it almost feels like, yeah, there's this, this kind of like, um, th this, this barrier to, to depth that happens there. I, I also find it though, like you're, you're. Certainly as well with, with the discussions when, you know, when a woman tells me that I, I don't know what it's, I don't know anything uh, or I have no idea what women go through or whatever. I, can, I, I hate that. I'm like, what do you mean? I don't know what women go through. Uh, I was a woman for most of my life. <laughs> um, so that's kind of forming some sort of, I don't know if I call it dysphoria now, but it's definitely some kind of discomfort in me. Um, and then also legally, you know, I, I do think it's it's kind of important to state that I'm not a male because I'm not. Um, but socially, I, I, I categorize my, myself as a man. Um, definitely. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's kind of come up that I wasn't expecting to come up. And then I also, uh, I've always, I've always been attracted to women, but um, in the last two years, I've, which I suppose is perfectly natural. I mean, we're animals, but I've, I've had this, um, this urge to, or, internal feeling i guess to to you know have biological kids to reproduce um so you know that's that's kind of a new thing to navigate especially with uh with dating it's quite interesting but um i don't know new things come up and i, I don't think me, I, I was too biased and I was too uh, tunnel visioned when I started this process to think about all this stuff. So, but the, you know, my, my I'm lucky. I'm I'm young, so, um, you know, from what I've talked to with my doctors, you know, I've I've come off testosterone, so I'm young, so there's there's no. Um, I'll still look like a man and have all the benefits. So, you know. Do you you, you stop taking testosterone? Yeah, I stopped uh, four months ago. So, um, see how that goes. Is that is that? And you, I mean, you don't have to answer answer this if this is too personal. But what did you was your decision to stop testosterone be, because of the fertility issue and and your desire to? to have biological children there's a few things that was one of them but also why take something that you don't need you know my i've i've got a pretty good beard going on and i i like the way i look and i don't have to have my hair long and i can dress the way i dress and my um the parts of the my body that i've removed surgically aren't gonna come back so they're all benefits um health reasons as well um i think it's a lot healthier if you're not taking substances that that you don't, you're you don't need um 
so and also it's you know I'm, I was on testosterone for about six and a half years so like why um I, I wasn't seeing any you know I didn't have that excitement of two weeks later or you see something different so um I mean I'm sure my body would continue changing over time very slowly but um like more probably more body hair and chest hair and things but like I don't know don't need that so I mean if it happens I'm more more than happy to have it but don't really care to be honest have you uh, felt any psychological change since you stopped taking testosterone? Like, like did you notice much of a psychological change when you first started? Um, and then now that you've stopped four months later, like, is there, is there a psychological uh, impact to you? Like how you, how you cognitively function, how you think, how you feel, any differences? Not really. Um, okay. I think I'm all, I've always been a very, I've been, a, I've always been a very logical thinker. That was something really interesting I discovered in secondary school. We call it secondary school, which is high school or middle school over in America. Um, and I was crap. I still can't do basic primary school, like simple maths. Um, primary school is, uh, whatever was before high school. I can't remember the name of it, but anyway. Um, and yeah, I still can't do that. I discovered when I started, when I, we throw all the algebra and the geometry in, all the complicated stuff. Uh, I was, a, I flew maths. I found it so easy. Um, and it really showed in conversations and information processing as well. Um, that and this is all it sounds terrible to people who aren't but it's it's just a psychological thing um but it's it's because of my brain i'm a logical thinker um so i think really uh like straight to the point basically linearly um sorry oh i just said linearly we'd call that linear linear, linear yeah. thinking yeah yeah um and I still think like that. So I noticed that got stronger. That probably is just coming out of adolescence and normal development. Um I put that down to. Um I did find myself the um when I was due my shot uh for about two weeks, I was crying, I was completely sobbing at stuff that I've never sobbed at before. Oh my god. Um but uh, it's, I, I will say my skin's got a lot better my acne's not has decreased and my cl skin is a lot clearer so that's that's quite a good thing um, but other than that not really um, I don't see myself like detransitioning or anything um, I was, I was slag slagging a bit uh Probably the guys don't know what that means, like joking. Uh, Irish people say it's lagging. We don't say joking. Um, uh, with Aaron, when we were chatting. Um, you know, like I had this conversation with my, with my endocrinologist last week. Actually, uh, he was asking me if if I want if I'm thinking about detransitioning or do I still see myself as Luke, and. Uh, in a way, I, you know, if if non-binary is a thing, you know, I would argue everyone's non-binary. But thankfully, you know, um, I'm I'm very comfortable showing myself like masculinely. So, like, I'm not uncomfortable with with my process. I'm very happy I did it, um, and I still I think I had to do the like we said earlier. I think I had to do a whole transition to um to get out of that zone tunnel vision zone and realize psychologically there was other stuff going on so um with regard to feminist stuff uh so i i like i don't i have no regrets or anything 
I was going to get my get a hysterectomy this summer. I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful I didn't. So many different different things I want to ask. Um, I did want to ask a little bit more because you know before we started recording, you, you said one of the things. How did you put it? You know, because Aaron and I both have similar histories in the sense that we both grew up in very conservative environments with 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 more um, more rigid gender roles. And you said that, you know that wasn't that wasn't the case for you. So I I mean one of the one of the um, hypotheses that feminists have that if only we ha if someone like Aaron and I if we if only we had grown up in more liberal households where we were exposed to to more diversity maybe we wouldn't be dysphoric right so that's one of the that's one of the hypotheses that people that people have right but you didn't grow up in a conservative environment where there was limited expectations on gender roles so I, I wanted to give you a chance to just kind of explain your thinking because I think you said that if if we were to do what the feminists are are, um, are advocating for, that we just completely open up this idea that women get to be whatever they want, men get to be whatever they want, you were saying that you didn't think that would solve Not the, trans, the trans question. So can you just unpack a little bit of your thinking about that and why you think that wouldn't work? Anyone who is a feminist listening to this, I'm really sorry. I'll listen to you. What, we, I will happily have a discussion with you, but I will go after the, the, not the, fem, the second wave or first wave feminists, but the third wave feminists and whoever's advocating for, oh, if we just equalize everything out, that's, that's not going to work. And uh, we know this from Scandinavia. Um, you know, the, the, the more statistically the, the, what I've seen, the more we equalized society the more and we've seen it in ireland as well i've seen it um they've been really trying to push girls um into stem fields and into uh you know micro computers and things like that uh, and they just they won't they won't go into it and um, some of them will but they, they won't uh as much as we open it up they just start they they don't have the interest the way boys do um and that i'm not saying at all that that look men and women can a man can biologically i will argue not but uh socially look men and women can do any work doesn't matter what gender you are or what you have or whatever um they're ca both capable of doing exactly the same thing um but Saying from what what I, statistically that I've seen from Scandinavia, um, and that I've, un, I've what I understand is, uh, they've pushed policies like that other countries haven't that uh, to equalize everything out, but we're seeing the opposite effect of men going into uh more masculine stereotypical stem fields and women are going into more feminine stereotypical stem fields uh, and then if you i can't remember who did this but if you put all the countries on top of each other statistically of how much we've they've equalized each country is equalized so if you put all the Equality Act countries or policies that try and equalize the gender stuff um, at the top uh, and all of the rest, the more conservative religious countries at the bottom, you'll see that the, the differences in men and women actually increase. They don't decrease, they increase. Um, and what certainly what I saw was presented to me was, you know, men and women, you know, I, I went into my dad's office, he worked as an engineer, um, and like I saw men and women. Uh, I went into a shop or a mall or my education places, like there was both genders everywhere I went. Uh, and 
it was really the I had gender dysphoria anyway, so I'm not saying that the feminism movement just was the only thing. It definitely wasn't, but it definitely pushed me to uh, psychologically. It pushed me to transition. Um, from hearing that, like, you know, male males have privilege, males uh, have an easier life than women. Uh, males uh, don't have to give birth. Males make more money. Males, uh, males don't have to deal with the stuff that women have to deal with. Um, hearing all that, like, like. I, I kind of went through, like, I didn't understand. I saw trans women tra transition. I was like, what the hell are they doing? Um, and I saw, uh, like, I was in an old girls' school for four years, and uh, I was kind of looking at them, like, well, why, like why, why the hell would you want to be a girl? Um, and I just couldn't wrap my head around it. It was so weird to me. Um, and also like hearing stuff like, um, where, uh, women are, are going to be like women get abused, women, um, like women ha have a terrible time in, in marriages and all this kind of stuff. Um, that really went into my head and I think it was also because of it didn't help that I was such a logical thinker as well, or a parallel thinker, or whatever you want to call it. Um, I, I thought very straight, you know. Um, and why, why would you want to be a, a girl? You know, why? Like, so when my first step was like, right, well, I'm, I'm just, I'm not going to date men. I'll just date women because. That was always open to me. I always knew that was an okay thing to do. Um, so, yeah, I just said, right, I'm just going to date women. I won't date men. And then I found out what transgender was. And I said, boom, grant, uh, my dysphoria will be cured. Uh, I'll, you know, make more, I'll make more money. I'll, everything, life will just be better. When now I'm on the other side and now, I'm looking at girls and I'm comfortable as a man. I like being seen as a man. Uh, my dysphoria is definitely, body dysphoria is definitely decreased uh, dramatically. But I'm kind of looking at girls now and I'm like, well, you know, I'm, I'm missing out on the female privileges of life. And I, that could have been me. And it's made, made my dating life harder um and it's it's made my relationships harder uh so and it's 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 having it it's i'm i'm starting a career in the next year and a half i'm starting my career and i have legal questions that no one has the answer to so it's not going to transition doesn't fix everything. Yeah. Solve some problems and create some, some others. Yeah. And it does not matter if you have gender dysphoria, I believe that's a biological thing. Uh, if you've had it as a kid, it's biological and it does not matter at all. If you're, you're in a really liberal household, like I was. And if you're in, a conservative religious makes no difference. It's helpful to get that that take on it, right? Because if we only talk to trans people that grew up in very conservative environments and households, you know, we, we might get a skewed image of, of what all of this is about. It's interesting that for you hearing the feminist talk about, you know, men are this and men are this and men are this, it's almost like for you, it was like a sales pitch on ma on manliness. Like, <laughs> like why, why would anyone right. want to be anything other than a man if men have it so good and women have it so bad? So it, it's something to, yeah. for them to maybe think about, right, is what is the impact of their messaging on, on young, really impressionable like minds? But no, that's the one thing I want to get across. Like, I mean, yeah. I don't, if you grew up in a, in a conservative environment and 
you know, you couldn't express yourself. Like, that's obviously very hard, but, um, you know, it's like, it's like any condition. You know, if you have a condition and if it's neurological or it's physical or whatever, if you have a disability, you know, there's always, it's better if you have thing if you have things that can help and family members that, can kind of understand and put things in place for you but it's not going to make it like it's still going to be there you know so i i like i mean i have family members who are feminists but i i would call myself a feminist in the sense that i don't want you know, I want equal rights for everybody and I want, although I don't really know what that means. Every, I want equal opportunity for everyone. I don't think everyone, I don't think, I think equality and equity mean completely different things. But, um, like, I agree with the feminists in that sense, but I don't agree with, like me being on the other side now is definitely like, and I've, I've talked, I've talked, I was talking to a guy the other day that he's afraid of communicating with women. And he's, he's afraid of just being a man dating women because he's heard all this kind of stuff as well. Um, and that's not going to benefit women who want to find a partner, you know? So um, and I find that these are the same kind of people that are saying no to con to transition full stop, uh, but they're still saying these things. So, yeah, I, I do I do want to get that across really. One of the things that that some uh, feminist ideologies and the trans ideology have in common is this idea that gender is entirely socially constructed and. And I think that's what you're you're saying that when countries have have gone with that idea, saying that well, gender is entirely socially constructed, therefore we're going to just kind of dismantle, um, a you know, oppressive understandings of what it means to be male or female, and and we'll encourage women to do more science stuff and encourage men to do more, I don't know, childcare and nurturing. And you're saying that when they've when they've tried to open that up, that people ended up kind of self-selecting into more traditional roles. And and I, I think that's something that, that we um, drew out of when we had our talk with um, Carol Hooven about the impact of testosterone on on psychology and behavior and and the differences between men and women. That there are behavioral psychological drives and differences between men and women that are that that are biologically. Bio, biology based and we see that across the animal kingdom right that without you know complex concepts and social constructs of, of a gender and sexuality i mean great apes still have social systems in which the female animals behave differently than the male animals and and because of our ability to reason i think the difference between us and animals is that we are able to make choices and not just be victim to our instincts and our, and our drives. We can choose, you know, to, to not do something, even though we might feel driven to. So one of the things Carol mentioned is that men tend to, you know, because they have, have, a, have a greater sex drive, especially early, like as adolescents, that they may end up behaving in ways that are, that are harmful because of that drive. And we are able to make choices. No, I'm not gonna rape women, you know, even though my sex drive is out of control. So, but, but the, we do still have biological, biology-based differences between the sexes that no amount of like social, um, social reconstruction is gonna change that. No, um, I would have to listen to you say that again and, <laughs> wait and come back to you in about ha about four or five days to <laughs> understand what you just said in a very deep manner but uh, I, I do think it's based in biology and it's based in culture but like 
I always give the uh, op- the <sighs> I give the exam. I like to give the example, me being an animal lover, um, of like, okay, I want everyone listening to this to picture an occupy. Just picture an occupy. What the fuck's okay? an occupy? Exactly. This is my point. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's, that's all I'm asking. Everyone picture an octopus. Okay. Let's make this fun, right? Let's make this fun. Aaron Ter- Terrell, what, what do you have in your mind? Picture an octopus there for me. Uh, I guess my brain uh, conjures an image of an octopus because that's what lingually is the closest I can come up with, I guess. Okay. Well, you're way off. Right. Aaron. <laughs> That's where my mind went to. I thought I thought maybe you like had this word that was like the singular for octopus, like or maybe octopi means octopi means like a, a whole bunch of octopuses. I don't know. I don't know. You're right. Oct- octopi is multiple octopi. Octopus. Okay. Yeah. Um, there's no such thing as octopuses um, <laughs> that I know of. So. This is actually fun to do in Ireland because there's Occupy in Dublin Zoo and any Irish people listening to this, the, the people always ask me what Occupy is. Um, but they, they, they never can tell me. And I say, have you been to Dublin Zoo? And he's like, yeah, loads of times. And he's like, yeah, well, you do know because you saw them. Um, but my whole point here is that I cannot, you guys cannot picture an Occupy because you probably haven't been exposed to it or you it's not a common knowledge animal so when i you know when we look at the binary of i would argue it's not man and woman it's masculine and feminine um then i find it very difficult to understand like i understand the whole non-binary thing of being a mixture of masculine and feminine or whatever but when you say you're off that complete spectrum I myself personally can't picture that because it's it's out of my conceptual mind. But if I pick, tell you guys, I want you guys to picture an elephant. What are you going to picture? Yeah, I can picture that much much more clearly, right? I can picture right, the trunk so and the big ears, and yeah. An octopi is a cousin of uh, of the giraffe. And it's kind. It's got like it's got two horns, and it's got like a head of giraffe, but not the colours. It's a brown animal body. It's brown, um, and they're they've got like hooves, and the legs look like zebra striped legs. You can Google Akapi, or come up, but that's kind of my point. That like we cannot conceptualize the outside of our of the unknown. We, we don't know the unknown. Mm-hmm. That's kind of what I'm getting at. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fun little exercise. That's good. Yeah. That was really good. Yeah, you left me with something <laughs> to think about. Okay. So great, <laughs> it's been great chatting with you today, Luke, and getting to know you a little better. Um, hope we get a, a chance again at some point. Yeah, I think I think we kind of went a bit all over the place, but sure, look. You have a lot of unique, unique and interesting perspectives. So, yeah, I think I think this is going to be, uh, yeah, leave a lot, leave leave people with a lot to think about. Yeah, we don't want this to be an echo chamber, right? And and so it is helpful that you have some some ideas and perspectives that that we hadn't thought of. So I really appreciate you know that you're helping us open up this conversation even wider. Yeah, well, uh, I like the fact that you've you've developed what you have and. Um, uh you know it's good that i think we found the the first day that we uh we all chatted uh offline um that we're all kind of coming from different aspects and backgrounds and we don't agree all like ourselves as a organization or whatever or as a group uh we don't agree with everything which is is where I'm kind of looking for at the moment. So um, I'm I'm kind of looking at doing and um, I'm going into the outdoor outdoor uh, adventure sports 
area in in my career and I'm hoping to do some studies in that aspect uh, here in Ireland so it's 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 difficult to do but uh, there's not many trans people in this area um but I definitely personally think it's it's biological um the because I used to think it was social uh, like yourselves but I don't really know to be honest but it it it, I enjoyed the chat and I kind of I feel like I kind of ranted a bit at the start I was a bit nervous but sure look <laughs> no, I did great it, it, yeah so you did great it's been it's been awesome to talk to you and hear just hear your thinking about things right you're you're living in a different part of the world you grew up in a different um, kind of environment than than we did so appreciate you willing to come on and, and share your a bit of your life and, and your ideas with us yeah and the, the other thing i want to say is that it's it's great to know whether i mean uh, other than scott nugent and uh book angel i think the, they're the only two guys that i could find that you know have transitioned for a long period of time um and have had health issues or haven't had health issues or whatever with regarding this and i'm not saying that every trans person is going to have health issues from transitioning but um it's it's great to know that there are other people out there um and i'd say there are plenty of i don't know of any but which is kind of interesting but i i i'd say there are plenty of trans women as well out there the same position so it's great it's great to have you guys um for uh us in our in our in 20s <laughs> The, uh, the elders. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, they're more, more knowledgeable sometimes as well. <laughs> We tend to we tend to attract the, the older the older crowd is like most of the people who come on and talk to us I think have been you know uh, in our age age range you know I'm I'm uh, I'm pushing forty right and it's like Aaron you're pushing fifty like we're yeah. uh, we're the older uh, and it seems like people people are drawn to this conversation or of the older ilk uh, as well and so uh, we really appreciate you know the young ones such as yourselves <laughs> coming on and and, and giving their perspective because you you kind of grew up um, or not really but but you know, like it, it, this was some transition was in your pur purview in your in your adolescent years, um, in, in a weird round of, roundabout way. But that's something that you know we didn't have, um, and so having the perspective of of the the younger people who who grew up in a world where dysphoria and transition was talked about uh, in in the teenage realm is. Um, yeah, it's, those are also the, the cohort that don't want to have these critical conversations about it as well. So, um, so yeah, your perspective and your uh, your 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 reality and your your critical lens on all this is, yeah, really beneficial in that regard. Cool, I'm glad. You, you guys are still young. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's kind of you. <laughs> Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Transparency Podcast. If you enjoy our content, please help out our algorithm by hitting like or subscribe. If you'd like to make a donation, follow the link to our PayPal account. On behalf of the Gender Dysphoria Alliance, thanks for your support.